Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voison, the host of Inside Personal Growth. And we have Dr. Lance Secretan joining us, and he is no stranger to Inside Personal Growth. He's been on the show many times for, well, it says he's done 24 books. I think it's actually been more than that, but at least his bio says 24. Good day to you, Lance. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thank you, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. Well, it's good to have you back on again and speaking about another new fascinating book for all of you who are joining us on video. You can actually see on his screen, Awakening the Human Spirit. It's in the upper left-hand corner of, of his video. We do not have a book here in studio. Lance, do you have a book close by that you can go like this with? <laughs> Let me find it. Where is it? Here it is. Yeah. There we go. There's the new book. That's it. You know, so everybody who is interested, we'll put a link to Amazon. Lance uh, has just basically shown you a copy of the book. And I would say definitely go out and get it. I'm going to let the listeners know. Something about Lance for all of those of you who are in corporate America listening to this show and you're like, who is this guy? We don't know who he is. Um, And believe it or not, Lance, it's the speed of you and I in our current ages. There might be some people out there that don't know who we are. There you go. (laughs) Although I've been around as long as most of them have been alive. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So Dr. Lance Secretan is a spiritual thought leader, the world's top authority on inspirational leadership, a trailblazing teacher, advisor, and expert on corporate culture, whose best-selling books, inspirational talks, and life-changing retreats have touched the hearts and minds of hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. As it says in his bio, he's the author of 24 books about leadership, inspiration, corporate culture, and entrepreneurship, as well as award-winning memoir, A Love Story. And he is the author of dozens more. His latest book, the one we're speaking about today, Reawakening the Human Spirit, Lance is a riveting speaker. I've actually seen him in, um, I was in New Mexico, the first time that I saw him. Um, I've actually been to his house in the outskirts of Toronto doing a uh, retreat. And he's just a fascinating guy. He's a former CEO of Fortune 100 Company, university professor, award-winning columnist, poet, author, outdoor athlete. He teaches, coaches, and advises globally. And he's in the top 30 most influential executive coaches and the top 30 most influential leadership experts. So, and it goes on, but he is a, a, a true soul who's interested in helping people. And this shows about personal growth, their own personal growth and transformation. And that's what this latest book is, is about. Um, and all of us know that in corporate America, let's face it, there is issues with um, today, Lance, what we would say um, stress, okay? And the stresses are coming, whether self-induced or not, they're there, and corporate America is trying to deal with them. What would you say in the main theme of this book would be about helping people deal with and coping with not only their personal lives, but working in a very stressful corporate life. Well, it's interesting you you raise the subject of stress because in the early part of the book, I make the point that stress is a choice. Stress isn't something that happens to us. We right. choose stress. You know, if, we, if I'm driving on the highway, somebody cuts me off in the traffic, I can... Uh, I have a choice. I can get mad and shake my fist and flip the bird and be angry and make sure I yell at him <clears throat> and make sure that person knows how stupid I think he is. But all that does is put me in stress. Or I can wave and say, have a nice day. I'm really grateful for the life I have. Move on. That's a choice. I agree that stress is a choice. And the key is, is to be able to take a deep breath and reframe where you are and you are a great meditator you are somebody who's into mindfulness but 
you're saying, and I wouldn't say you argue, but that we artificially separate home and work yes. and lots of other things too. And that this book is about people, human beings, not titles. Okay, in corporate America, we still are using titles. People are, you know, it's like, is he VP of sales? Is he the CEO? Is she the head of HR? You say you go on to explain that we're simply people in different scenarios and our values, behaviors, and spiritual goals should be consistent in all aspects of our lives. I get that. Okay. How do you help people in this world make that transition? And what is meant by the spark, the flame, and the torch? Questions there. Well, let me just start by saying. Well, there's one um, question core to it, which I'll say. Okay. is this separation between home and work. Right. Um, you made it very clear to me that it should be one. Yes. Um, and, and I go back to the day of going to conferences, which you were at many of those, and it was called Spirituality in the Workplace yes. uh, by the gal that's now down in, um, what is her name? She started working for the Sam Walton in the Walmart University area down there. And um, my point was way back then, and I'm saying 30 years ago, we were talking about spirituality in the workplace. Right. Let's talk about this separation between work and home. Well, that's an illusion. I mean, the reality is, especially as we're seeing this with the work from home phenomenon and so on, what happened during COVID, is that the, the creation of a separate existence called work is artificial. You have to know this. The first time we ever used the word work was in the 1600s. We didn't have a place to go to work. There was nowhere to go to. If you were a blacksmith, it was in the back of your house. So, you know, and if you were hungry, you went out and got a deer. <clears throat> so you didn't go to the supermarket. There was nowhere to go to work. So we invented the word when we started building factories and when we started building offices. And so we've been using work now for, shall we say, 500 years. But then COVID happened. And look what happened. We went back to where we were 500 years ago, working from home again. This is natural. We should understand that. That's one thing. The second thing is this. We treat business as a separate entity. We have language that's unique to business. We only talk certain jargon and so on in business. We do things in business that we would never do anywhere else. We destroy the competition. You wouldn't do that at home. We have performance appraisals. You wouldn't do that at home. Would you have a performance appraisal with your spouse? Hi, honey. It's that time of year. We're going to have a little conversation about your budget and your 360 and KPIs and so on. You'd get thrown out for a conversation like that because it's demeaning, disrespectful, and frankly, useless. So that's, that's the whole package of things around what we're doing at work and how we're messing it up is, is one issue. But a bigger issue than that is that the world is hurting right now, all around. So we've got so many things happening that feel so heavy for so many people. Ukraine, COVID, polarization, uh, climate change, inflation, job loss, you name it. I mean, it's just endless. And I yes, can't fix yes. these things. None of us can fix them. I can't fix Putin. There's nothing I can do about that. You know, your book argues that we are artificially separating home and work uh, and lots of other things you say too that we're separating this is a very divisive world that we live in now um, that you were just speaking about and this book is about people human beings not titles it's a bit it goes on to explain that we're simply people in different scenarios and our values and behaviors and spiritual calls should be consistent um, speak with us about that because we're not different people at work than we are at home. We're supposed to be the same people, although we're expected to be different at work than we are at home. Yet, how does that work for people? Because you're saying if today you asked a population over 80% of them, if they could, they would actually quit their job today if they had a free choice to do so. And that's pretty alarming statistic. If it's truly 80% that are saying, I don't really want to be here. I'm disengaged anyway. That's a tough thing for corporate America. I've asked that question hundreds of times of large audiences. And every single time I've asked it, it's been 80% or more. Yeah, so I think that's a proven fact. There's a lot of people that if they had a free choice, they would quit. I mean, you don't want to be cleaning toilets all day long. That's not your dream. So you know, there are lots of people doing things that they don't want to do. 
look, I can go down the bottom of my driveway and go up to a stranger and hug them and tell them I love them. No problem. They might look at me a little weird, but no problem. If I do that at work, I'm probably going to be taken to the human resource department for a little bit of uh, correction and uh, behavior training. What's with that? I'm a human being. Why can't I say I love people that I work with? They're people too. What's the matter with us? Where did we build this? And frankly, the answer, and without going into too much depth, but in an earlier book I wrote called The Bellwether Effect, which you're familiar with, I showed that most of what we do there came from the military because we didn't know how to run companies. And so we turned to the military and said, what are they doing in leadership? How do they find pilots that die in the war? That was called the performance appraisal. What is a battle strategy? That's called a mission. Well, you know, we've got those things in business now. That's what happened. So now we need to say, wait a minute, it's not war. It's not the military. This is just people in different places. We need to inspire them. That's the other key, not leadership, inspiration. And Lance, so, you know, speaking about that bellwether effect, you know, why is it that we have a tendency as a species to wait to the last minute to change anything? It almost has to get to this, you know, disastrous spa uh, space. Um, I've had social scientists on here that talk about it. You mentioned a minute ago, um, we're concerned about Putin. There isn't anything you can do about it. We're concerned about uh, the changing weather patterns and CO2 emissions and global warming, uh, our environment overall generally. Yet we have a tendency as a species to wait to it's almost the last minute to try and do something. You're trying to tell corporations or inform them why are you waiting so long to change this culture so that you would allow something like this to occur? Yet this, this meme is there. It's, it exists, right? It's very strong. Right. right? And uh, we're going to see the collapse of the, of the contract between employees and employers. Because employees, as you can see from many of the statistics now, they're in charge. And they're mm -hmm. going to call the shots. Gen Generation Z, for example, wants nothing to do with corporate world. And you know that's, that's tragic. If you get to that place, capitalism is at risk. So we need to think this through carefully. And I, let me just make this point, Greg. Why are we dragging people back to the office? And the answer is not because it's efficient or it builds teams or it's good for the culture, because frankly, we can do that on the internet too. That's not, I mean, yes, of course, human presence is important, but it's not the only way to do this. The reason we're doing this is because people are saying, I've got a fancy, flashy office. I've got a big overhead. I need to fill it up with people. Get your ass over here. <laughs> That's, the wrong, That's the wrong reason. That's the wrong reason. We should be saying, Greg, there's a job that needs to be done here. My job is to figure out what's the best way for you to do that. What would work for you? Well, so... How do you develop, for people out there listening that are in the corporate world and they're saying, hey, I really appreciate what Lance is saying, but I don't know how to bridge it. How do you build these heartfelt leadership kind of models, this, this, this from for traditional models to heartfelt leadership, right? Well, and I know that the torch, I'm sorry, that the spark, the flame and the torch have been something you've been carrying around for many, many, many years. And it also is back on the front cover of this right. book on a subtitle right underneath human spirit. And I think people need to understand that. And they maybe don't understand that about you. You've been teaching in corporations for many years, but this is a big kind of turn for you as well. Yeah. It is. Yeah, absolutely. Because as we have turned, I'm trying to keep pace with what's going on in our society, and I think corporate leaders haven't caught up yet. They will, because when you run out of people, you're going to have to figure out what you're going to do about that, right? Mm -hmm. But here's, here's the thing that's, that's failed. I think leadership has failed, because we spend $170 billion a year on leadership development. We've got uh, 240,000 books on Amazon about leadership. We've got every university program in the country teaching a leadership course, and you can't find solid leadership anywhere. Right. Not, in Washington, not in Washington, not in corporate America, not in the police, the Roman Catholic Church, healthcare, doesn't matter where you look, it's a mess. So why would we keep doing that? And the answer is that underpinning all of that leadership theory is motivation. Motivation is a fear-based system. Yes. That's, that's what we saw with COVID. Not inspiration. 
Motivation. Correct. Correct. And, and inspiration is a love-based system. So what we're actually needing, Greg, everywhere, not just at work, everywhere, is inspiration. You, you, you inspire me. I'll do anything. I, I'm in, when I pick up a rose and smell it, it's because I'm inspired by the rose. If I go and go to an Eric Clapton concert, it's because Eric Clapton inspires me. And if he doesn't inspire me anymore, I'm on. I'm gone. We fall in love with people who inspire us. We go to work for companies that inspire us. And when they stop inspiring us, it's over. So what do we need to learn? And we are very bad at this. We need to learn how to inspire each other. Well, look, the, this whole soulful organization concept has been talked about. I'm not certain that it's been ingrained so much, but I remember going to trainings with Richard Barrett and with you and all kinds of people um, where we were talking about the soul of a business, yeah. right? Yeah. And can you explain what's kind of meant by that and describe what it means, the benefits to the corporate leaders that are listening to us today of becoming more of a soulful organization um, versus them going with command and control, which was, as you just said, oh, I'm, I'm demanding you now come back three days a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're saying, so what really is that good? It's going to do it's because I'm paying heavy rent on this building and I need to fill it up again. Right. 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 <laughs> and you need to be here because I want you to be accountable to us because you're not accountable if you're sitting at home. Right. I don't trust you, in other words. Right, right. Yeah. And accountability is one of those words that I was referring to earlier that we use in the workplace that we wouldn't use elsewhere. Right. I would never, I would never say to my spouse, I'm going to hold you accountable for doing that. Right. She threw me out. Right. <laughs> and why, why would I take that risk? And yet I do it every day at work. Why would but I if we're going to, if we're going to liberate, pardon me for using liberate the corporate soul, which was Richard's kind of quote yeah. unquote thing. And you look at the model, you know, you look at the hierarchy, you know, when you yeah. look at all these models that are built that are around, you know, getting our basic needs met. Well, we re, you and I know this, it, there isn't much different in somebody's life, whether they're making 50,000 or 100,000, right? Because it's really meaning and purpose in one's life that brings more fulfillment, that brings more joy. And you're saying none of these people that are there are getting the meaning and fulfillment that they want in that structure that they're in, which is why 80% of them would walk out the door tomorrow if, if they had a choice. Well, and it's because it's, it's words and talk, not actions. Right. Uh, to, to pick on one example, and uh, you may disagree with me here, but last year, uh, the CEO of Google made $226 million. This is one person. Right. That's, a quarter, that's a quarter of a billion dollars in case anybody's yeah. not doing the math. <laughs> <laughs> it's the sort of thing where you buy a fighter plane or something, or something like that, right? Right. And at the same time, 20,000 people lost their jobs. Okay, what signal does this say? And now you talk about family and the soul of the business. Wait a minute. This is not computing, right? This is right. what's wrong. We've got right. to behave in a way that sends the same message. The way I describe this is the message and the messenger need to be the same. I don't know if equanimity is the right term. I, I, I could say that, but the equalness, right? We're all human beings together. You know, if you were in a very stressful situation and you were going to help your fellow man, you wouldn't care if they had a million dollars or fifty dollars, right? right. Um, and I think that's where you're getting to. Is you know, I, I saw something last night about the kindness project. You know, go around and be kind. You know, just help people out during the day. Just, just you know, play play that role. I think most of us would be kind. Many of us might be selfish, but you would like to think that most people would be kind, right? Um, well, and in your case, if you're going to build a soul based on conscious capitalism, because you just said something a minute ago uh, about capitalism, that it's in, um, it, it's basically, it, it, it's in peril, yeah. that the way in which we're operating today I right. think there'd be many that would disagree with you, but I don't disagree with you. But um, 
when you take values and mission and my purpose, and you say, I'm going to be a soulful corporation, what does that feel like for somebody out there who's listening today in HR or a CEO position? They're saying, well, I love everything you're saying, but I don't really know how to get there. Well, one of the things is that it's going to take time. You asked a very good question earlier, which is, you know, what, what's with human beings that we wait to the last minute? Uh, you yeah. might want to ask, ask uh, the Senate Majority Leader and uh, the <laughs> Leader of Congress yeah. why they're about to tank the economy, uh, leaving it to the very, very last minute. You know, that's a good question. We keep doing this. Well, the answer is, as you can see from that example, and politics is another uh, example of like climate change, it's, it's about self-interest. It's not about the long term. So if we hook up a CEO and an executive team to something like a $226 million payout, if you get the profits right, then all these other things we're talking about are irrelevant because the only criteria is how much money we're making. Right. And I'm not, I'm not saying money is a bad thing because it is the capitalist system and I'm part of that and I'm all for it. But I think we need to get this thing a little straighter because uh, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be fired by a man through email that I don't even hear about one-to-one -one, who just got himself a $226 million paycheck. That doesn't mm -hmm. work for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it is a dichotomy that exists in this world today uh, about trying to do that. And you can see this uh, fabric uh, starting to fray. Yes. In, in so many different places in our world. Yeah. Um, and you, you said that the, you suggest that who we are impacts others and makes a difference in the world more than what we know. Um, OK. And you use the metaphor of Dalai Lama sitting silent in the room for 15 minutes and inspiring everyone. I've actually seen the Dalai Lama twice in person. And I have to admit, I've never seen a man so jolly as the Dalai Lama. And I was with, I was just at the Richie Davidson, who's doing all the studies uh, in um, Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin on, you know, Dalai Lama told him 30 years ago, you need to study not stress and anxiety, but compassion and love and understanding. And it changed uh, Dr. Richie Davidson's whole life. I mean, his whole life now has been dedicated to this work. And, you know, when you look at the Dalai Lama and then sitting in a room for 15, 15 minutes, um, why is it, in your estimation, that we feel so much more inspired by that energy than we do, conversely, the energy on the other side where we actually are afraid? Well, you know what? Yeah, you yeah, we, we, we feel more fearful in one yeah. and we feel more present and joyous in the other. Loved is what loved. we feel. Yeah. Yes. We feel frightened in the one situation, motivation, and loved in the other, inspiration. Right. Uh, to, to make this clear for people, motivation I describe as lighting a fire under someone. Mm -hmm. Inspiration is lighting a fire within someone. In somebody. There's a big difference. We don't do inspiration. You know, we do motivation. Like if you hit your sales targets, I'm sending you on a package to Hawaii. That's motivation. If you buy a Corvette today, a big fancy $100,000 car, they won't let you sell that for six months. If you do, you lose your warranty and uh, you get penalized. If you keep it for six months, they give you a $5,000 bonus. That's motivation. We use motivation everywhere, in politics, in marketing, in advertising, in leadership, everywhere it's fear-based. COVID, perfect system, fear-based system. Yeah. Well, we don't know how to inspire. And inspiration is about lifting the hearts of people. And if we can do that, if we know how to do that, that'll change the world. Well, you know, we talked about the subtitle of this book, and it, I've had many of your other books, and always... The spark and the flame. Let's talk about the spark. Yes. Because this is how you actually help make these shifts is defining the ones, as you call it, destiny, character, and calling. And you call it the why be do. Right. Um, many listeners out there don't have a clue about your spark and your right. flame and any right. of that. And they certainly don't have any 
thing. I remember you gave us little cards with the YB do, right? right? So, so explain if you would, because this is the start of the process um, for what you, you now call, and, and ultimately it gets into the castle. And we'll get yes. there, the principles right. of the castle. Right. Well, you know, the, the, this all started when I started to research what great leaders did. I wanted to find out living and past leaders, what made them unique? Because people were drawn to them. Look at Martin Luther King, for example. People flooded to him. Mm -hmm. Same thing for Christ, same thing for Buddha, same thing for Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela. These were all people that people gravitated towards. So there was a magnet there. People felt the passion. What was that? This is what I wanted to study. Well, I know that they had three things. They had a lot of other things, but three things that I really focused on. They knew why they were here. Now, when I say that, I don't mean I'm here to get my kids to college and uh, to retire and right. uh, get on my pension and live a happy life in retirement. I don't mean that. I mean, in the end, when it's all over, would you have made a difference? As Steve Jobs said, you know, did you put a ding in the universe? So the question became, what was your impact? Did you make it better? You were here for 100 years. Did you do something that was useful? Or did you just sleepwalk all through this? That's important. So Gandhi knew why he was here. Martin Luther King knew why they were here. Mother Teresa knew why they were here. That was, that was their North Star that guided everything. You could not shift Gandhi from his belief in nonviolence or Martin Luther King. But don't there you see no in many of those people that you're you're referencing, and I love the references to Mother Teresa and Gandhi and all these and Dalai Lama, but it's always an inverse relationship in the way in which leadership has worked for years, almost like Robert Greenleaf, right? Yes. We're here to serve them. They're right. not here to serve us. But if you look at Gandhi, it was always about him serving his constituents and all the people that were around him. When you look at Dalai Lama, it's about what can I do to help and serve, right? But all along, it hasn't been in corporate America about what can I do to help and serve the people that work in here. It's been about what can they do to help and serve me so the stockholder value can go up. That's the military model. Yeah. You, don't, you don't serve people in the military either. You tell them what you need done and get it done. And if they don't, right. fuck them. You know, it's end of story. It's autocratic command and control. That's the military system. That's what we imported. And we haven't shaken it off. It's still there. We call it different things, more fancy language and so on, but it's the same. That's one thing. I mean, I think the other thing is that we, we, are, bit, we are afraid of what it takes. It's not isolated, Greg. I mean, think about Patagonia. Patagonia has got a long history of behaving properly as a company. Yeah. And sometimes you give up profits because you're on a journey. So these leaders knew why they were here. The second thing they knew was their character, how they wanted to be while they're here. How do you want to be known? What's your brand? What do you live for? Nonviolence was Gandhi's brand. Martin Luther King, same thing. And what do you want to do? You have certain gifts and talents. How are you going to use those to serve the world? And you know from the names I've mentioned what they committed themselves to in terms of practice. They didn't, they were they weren't consultants or rock and roll stars or firefighters. They knew what they wanted to do and they did it the way they wanted to do it. So why am I here? How am I going to be? What am I going to do? Why be do? And by the way, little fun thing here. Uh, there's an app on the uh, uh, Android and Apple stores. It's called Spirit at Work Cards. It's a book I wrote in 2002, but it's an app now. And you can shake the app and it shuffles the cards. And if you want to be inspired, you'll find this app very inspiring. It's free. But uh, there's an upgrade version. In the upgrade version, you shake a card and you choose a to be card. The to be card is the card you chose today. So if you choose courage today, your job is to be more courageous. And then if you don't like that card and you go and try and change it, it says you can't change it today. You have to live this today. You'll get a new card tomorrow. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, Lance, about love. You know, in yes. in the flame section, flame yes. relates to me to love, right? Yes. Um, you re and, and reawakening the human spirit, you describe the castle. Now you've been using this castle for a long time. This isn't new to this book, right? Um, but these principles, you point out that love people who embody the castle principle. Um, do you know anyone who embodies 
the six castle principles, and that's what I want you to talk about, is those six castle principles, because at the heart of it, at the heart of it, that's the essence of what we're talking about here is, you know, truly it's, uh, I love you, you love me. I remember, and I don't know if I said this to you, but there's a, around that corner over there, there's a saying from the Dalai Lama. In the end, the only way you're going to be remembered is by the people you love, the people that loved you and how much you let go. Right. And you say, well, that's so simple. But really, none of this has to be that complicated. Well, uh, let me tell you a little story. I was <laughs> I was on a podcast the other day with Marianne Williamson, who you know is running for president. Uh, uh, and I was reminding, I've known Marianne for a long time. We're good friends. And I, was reminding I hope she her, wins. Yeah. I hope somebody wins who has some sanity. <laughs> yeah, really. So I reminded her that uh, my wife and I went to visit her when she was living in Detroit. And I, we're having dinner. We stayed at a house and we're having dinner uh, that evening. And I said, Marianne, I'm so excited. I got this new idea. It's called the Castle Principles. It's an acronym and it stands for, and she said, just a minute, stop. Let me guess. C is for courage. A is for authenticity. S is for service. T is for truthfulness. L is for love. And E is for energy. And my mouth dropped. Like, I'd never shared this with anybody. I said, how did you know that? That's amazing. And she said, well, you know, I know your work, so I can cheat a little bit there. I won't expect you to talk about bombing or something, you know. But at the same time, what we've come up with is remarkable because there's nothing to remember. Mm-hmm. Now, that is crucial. You know, it's interesting that the seven habits of highly effective people is probably the most widely used, most popular management book and course series ever in history. But who can remember them? Right. Most people can remember two or three, maybe. They can't remember seven. But the castle principles are sticky because every single one of those castle principles we were born with. What we've done is forgotten. So we were always courageous. You know, babies are born courageous. They mm-hmm. go swimming in toilets and jumping up the uh, kitchen counters and uh, leaping off all kinds of things and doing all kinds of uh, dangerous stuff. They don't have any fear. They learn fear. Mm-hmm. They're, not born. They're not born with it. Mm-hmm. Love, is a, love is the same. What's more loving than a baby? But that goes away. After you've been punished a few times and being banged up a few times, you learn, don't, don't do that. That's not, that doesn't pay off. And so on. We tell the truth and then we get banged up for that. So we stop telling the truth. We start lying. So this is how we lose it. So all I'm really asking people here is to, is to remember what you've forgotten. No, you who you truly are. More, I mean, more Marianne courageous. Williamson got you right off the bat when she knew what all of those were. You right. know, I, I had one called the Solistic, S-O-U-L-I-S-T-I-C, and it was spirit, optimism, and unity, love, and, you know, g- goes on. But my point in truth, you're right. Those are descriptive words that go back to who we are. You know, but right. COVID did two things. First, you said it triggered us going back 500 years because back then we didn't even have a word for work but it also did something else um and and i want to talk about this because this is really 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 important isolation depression and loneliness and of people right and we became divided because nobody wanted to get anyone else's germs Um, Fortunately, that's over now, but it's almost like it's kind of hung on, Lance, and it's been hard to like, and I don't say that it was ever utopia anyway, but we've got this issue now. We got people that are sad. We got people that are depressed. We have corporations now that are dispensing through the medical facilities that they have their medical insurance with more Uh, antidepressants than ever have been used before in society. Um, I'm working with a doctor that uses ACE, adverse childhood experiences, to try and get to the core level of some of these problems. What would you say, because your book suggests that serving others is a way to remove depression, and I know I have my own nonprofit. I I serve the homeless, and I serve the refugees from uh, that are fleeing you. Ukraine going to Poland. 
and I'm buying bicycles for the kids. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good but my, and my point is, is that how do you help people really realize that giving service to others is a way to get out of the loneliness and the sadness and the depression, and probably you'll eliminate taking all of those medications that you're yeah. on. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, you know, the book opens up with a story like that, which is your, your, your girlfriend just broke up with you. You're angry, you're mad, you're depressed. So I have a choice. You go home, you binge watch TV, eat Doritos and pack, package by package, drink lots, do a lot of drugs and to hell with the world. That's one way of dealing with it. The other is to go out and paint your friend's be- bedroom wall and watch what happens when he is grat- or she is gratitude, shows their gratitude and love in return for the gift you gave them. Mm-hmm. And notice how you feel as a result. That builds you up. So to get over these things, we need to, I, and I don't mean to sound harsh when I say this, but we need to get out of our own heads. It's not about us. Yes, we may feel bad and all kinds of, look, we all go through things that don't work for us. I'm 84 years old. I've been through a lot of stuff. Right. So yeah. it's, not, it's not hurting me. And I've learned from it. I've grown from it. But it's not, I'm not beating up and I'm not depressed. I've never been depressed. But why? Because I serve all the time. My whole life is about serving as yours is. And so you can't be depressed when you're serving because that's inspiring for other people. And when they're inspired, they inspire you. And this is a key point too, by the way, Greg, because we are actually manipulators of each other's biochemistry. So what I'm actually doing with you, if we're, if I'm trying to be inspiring when I'm with you, I'm changing the biochemicals that flow through your body. If, mm-hmm. I, if I introduce fear and motivation to you, I will produce a different set, cortisol, stress hormones, mm-hmm. and so on. So, you know- Versus oxytoxin and yes, the ones yes. that I want. I want right. to actually have released, you know, I mean, and, and it's interesting because this corporate America is looking for more creativity, more innovation, more flow, as Stephen Covey calls it in the Flow Genome Project. But yet to get to these levels of flow, um, we look at people who try and hack it. So now you're saying, well, can I hack it with a, um, you know, a little a microdose of LSD? Well, the reality is you don't need to hack it as long as you're practicing these principles, as long as you understand these principles, yeah. I'm saying that, you know, look, we, a lot of corporations want more innovation. They want more creativity. They want all of this stuff. They're trying to get that out of the people that work for them. And, you know, I appreciate people that talk about hacking flow, using microdosing, using ayahuasca, using, using whatever. But again, if you're practicing these principles and you embed them within your DNA, you don't need to have some kind of substance to do that. Speak with us about love, because, you know, you and I I go back to the days of Herb Kelleher handing out M&Ms at Southwest Airlines Um, because he truly was trying to create the, it was LUV, by the way, folks, for those of you who don't really remember. Um, But he was quite an inspiring guy. Yeah, absolutely. He was. Right? Yeah. And and I think you say leadership. I don't see that many inspiring leaders anymore. Pardon me, but I don't. What I see is hammering leaders. Yeah. It's like they have two hammers and they're going like this. Right. right. That's fear and, and motivation. Fear and motivation. Yeah, but so I'm even me, saying leaders in, in our in our country, right? We're and I'm not saying Mr. Biden is a bad leader. I'm I don't get me wrong, folks. What I'm saying is we as a society in North America, let me just let me preface that because that's where most of my listeners come from. Um, we have seen some really strange changes, and I wouldn't call these leaders that we've had inspiring. I would call them disruptive, yeah. but not inspiring. Correct. Well, you asked me about love. Let me, before I do that, slow, go back to the spark for a moment, because I talked about the why we do, but there are two, right. other, pieces, two other pieces in the spark, and one of them okay. is about creating a dream. And that's a problem for most people. We have lost our dream. 
America's yeah. lost. America's lost its dream. Right. I agree. We had a, we had got a dream back that would change everything. But if you have a dream, in the morning you get up because you have a dream. Starbucks, as a company, has a dream, not a mission statement, a dream, and it's to be the third place. That's their dream. Microsoft has a dream. The dream is to empower every individual and every organization to achieve more. That's how they've quadrupled their business since Sakya Nadella took over. And he's a soulful man. Now, a dream is really important because we fall in love with a dream. And that's inspiring. And we're looking here for ideas that help us to become more inspired. But if you, you amble through life with no dream, you have no rudder, you have no compass, you don't know where you're going. Right. So now back to love. So love is part of the castle principle, C-A-S-T-L-E. So love is, is a word that we are afraid of and don't use in the business setting. But if I say to you, Greg, I love you. Mm -hmm. And I mean that. I'm not just saying that for effect on, on a podcast. I mean, I love you. How do you feel? I feel comforted. You know, I think um, love is something that brings warmth. Uh, you talk about the flame. You know, when we're sitting around a fire, uh, there's something that actually magically happens, you know, yes. around yeah. a campfire. I've been around many right. of them in my day. Right. And what really happens is kind of this openness under the stars to be vulnerable. Oneness. To nature. talk, to, talk mm -hmm. to your fellow neighbor about something you might not actually talk about. Um, yeah. And I think for us holding all of this maybe pain or grief or hurt inside love is somebody that you feel comfortable enough to tell them your real story. Right. And what I, so I feel, thank you for loving me and likewise return in, in tenfold. I love you because I love what you're doing. I love the fact that you've written another book. Nothing stops you. You're <laughs> unstoppable. And you also are somebody who's <laughs> wanting to make an impact, you know, not so much one-to-one, -one, but one-to-many. You're saying, hey, I, I want to get out here. I've got a big dream. And my big dream is that we, you know, we shift the consciousness of corporations um, yes. such that they're accepting of a new way of being, right? So talk about, if you would, and then we'll sum this up because we're getting close to the end of our uh, interview here. The fourth part is the torch. Mm -hmm. And you put a methodology for coaching, leadership, mentoring, teaching. And really, it's about creating a legacy because that's you know what you've got to do. Um, and you always talked about your values centered leadership. Um, speak a little bit about the torch. What results have you are you experiencing? And and what do you hope people will take away from reading? reawakening the human spirit good let me before i go there let me just finish uh, a, a point about love okay if you if you're with someone greg that is challenging or difficult mm -hmm. and you don't quite know how to handle them because they're prickly and complicated before you say anything just say this to yourself quietly without them hearing it just to yourself i love you Say it again. I love you. I love then, you. And then start your conversation. It will change the tone of everything. Simple technique. All right. So there's a torch. Well, the torch is how we go out into the world and what we do in the world that makes a difference. Right. So, yeah, we go out there and we, we, we do we our character and our legacy is how we will be known. Nothing else is left. The only thing that people will care about after you leave is what you did while you were here. Or like the Dalai Lama says, putting it another way, what your compassion and kindness and love was all about and whether people loved you and you loved others. Right. So that, that's the end. So what do we do in life? We do three things, mastery, chemistry, and delivery. We do what we do as well as we can, mastery. We do things with other people and with nature. That's chemistry. We have a connection, relationship. And then finally, delivery. With people, we identify the needs of others and we meet them. That's the only thing we do. Those three things sum up everything in our lives. 
So now the question becomes, well, if we want to grow, what do we do? Well, we accelerate all of those and there are accelerators for all of those. And there's a model in there and a coaching device and so on in that, in that reflection, as I call them. And so you know, there's a whole pattern for how we go out into the world and create legs. There's lots of ways of doing this, but the model I've shared here is a powerful way to do that. And indeed a very powerful coaching model. At the core essence though, Lance, for every corporate leader who's listening or VP or HR person or whatever that's listening to this show, not that they don't know or are unaware of what's going on. They're very aware. Mm -hmm. They're very aware. Um, what would you tell them or inform them of that could help them transition quicker to an, a new or revived, in your case, a reawakened um, organization? I think that one of the things I did when I was the CEO of Manpower Limited was uh, I warned shareholders that we could have some bumpy times because some of the things we wanted to do would take time mm -hmm. and investing in them in the short term would make for poor results on the bottom line temporarily because that was the investment in the future. But we need them to be OK with that, not start selling the stock because it didn't do well, because that's not a long term approach. As long as we do this 90-day thing where we've got to get the results on the bottom line every 90 days, we lose sight of everything else. So one of the things I think we have to do is sit down with shoulders and say, we need a new contract. And the contract is that we will have some bumpy times. Look what happened to Amazon. People kept buying Amazon stock when it was growing, and it never made any money. It, made mo it lost money for years and years and years in the early days. And yet, you know, that's not a problem. They did well. Why can't we do that in other organizations? That's one thing. But a more important thing, really, is how we treat each other. Because the result of that, and I've seen this over and over with companies I've mentioned, Starbucks, Microsoft, Kaiser Permanente, Humana, all kinds of clients that I've worked with over the years. And, and look at the results. Look what happens when we love each other. The first thing I say to a, a company when they hire me as a consultant, first thing I say is, look how well you've done up to now. Mm -hmm. been very successful. Imagine what you could do if everybody was inspired. Yeah, it is. Um, on, uh, it's a choice. Yeah. Just like you said at the beginning of this interview, stress was the choice. Yes. You have a choice. And I think more importantly, if you're aw awake and aware and alive, you understand the issues to resolve those issues is all about your personal choice to, to take action and your personal choice to be vulnerable and available to the people within your organization to actually create the movement. Cause that's what it's going to take in most companies is a complete movement to create the transformation. And while these words just kind of like dangle out there. Believe me, they're very, very important. And reawakening the human spirit is more important to the survival of your company than the next big sale you're going to make over here to somebody because you won't have anybody to actually follow through on those sales if you don't really start putting some attention into this, right? So Lance, an honor having you back in to talk about reawaking the human spirit, to speak about even some of the uh, historic principles you've been teaching all together, but you've ingrained into this book all into one. So instead of you buying 24 books now, everybody, you can, you can just go back and you can get this one book. And I would encourage you to go to his website, right? Um, so you, you know, just go to lancesecretan.com. That's one, right? Just, sec just secretan, secretan.com. Sec secretan and we'll have right. a link to that there. You can learn about his books. You can learn about his consulting. You can learn about what it is that Lance has been doing. As he said, he doesn't look it, but he's 83. He's been doing this a long time. And he also has, um, associates and coaches out there. So no matter where you are in the country, Lance can help facilitate uh, a transformation like this within your organization through the people that have trained 
through his um, through his programs, his leadership training programs. All over, all over the world, actually. Yep. 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 So I would recommend, highly recommend, if if any of this resonated to, with you in during our last 40 minutes of talking, uh, definitely reach out, uh, go to secretan.com and you will learn more and pick up a copy of this book on Amazon. You'll learn more there as well. You can get it in Kindle. You can get it in hardback. You can get it in paperback. Right, Lance? All three? Yeah, and audio. And audio. So it's available in all three, four, including audio. Namaste to you, Lance. Yeah, Thanks namaste for everything. Thanks for Thank being back on the show again and in, enlivening me and inspiring me. Well, thank I you. You it. do the same for me and for millions of other people. So, gracias. Okay. Well, I, it's been millions over the years. I hope they're all still listening. Yeah. Well <laughs> Hang done. tight. Thank you. Bye.